Well, I think we have some breaking news, apparently. So I will turn it over to our reporter in Egypt, Scoop. Scoop, can you hear me? Scoop? Hmm. I don't know. It's a long way away. Yes, there this is go. Scoop Singleton, coming to you from Egypt, where we just missed finding Jesus. Seems he and his family had been here for a while, hiding out. But with the death of Herod, they decided to move to Galilee, to a town called Nazareth. Seriously? The place is a dump. Can anything good come out of that Nazareth? Uh, what about the Church of the Nazarene? Hey, man. Hey, you're a cameraman. Stop using words. I'm Scoop. I am Scoop Singleton. And there it is. Who knew we had a news program, huh? <laughs> good morning. It's good to see you here today. I'm T.W. Davis, and I'm excited that you're here. Uh, and we're going to be uh, continuing through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, so we've already finished uh, the story surrounding Jesus' birth, which was uh, beautiful, and we're jumping right in where we left off. So the, uh, the Magi from the East have come to, to worship uh, the lowborn King Jesus. They, bear, they bore their treasures fit for a king, and they've just left the child right after they were warned in a dream not to go and tell the tyrant King Herod where the child is. So we're going to be still in chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod's about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. This is an interesting part of the story of Jesus. I mean, think about how the passage works, right? The king of Israel is here. He is born to sit on David's throne forever. The one who is to restore the kingdom, the one is to the one is the one who is here to establish peace. And yet the reigning king of Israel, Herod, doesn't see this as good news. He sees this as a threat. And so God warns Joseph to flee. Where does he tell him to flee to? Egypt. And this is shocking for two reasons. One, because first, the passage is so clearly a replaying of one of the most pivotal story arcs in the the nation of Israel. And secondly, how God has reversed one key detail in the story to show how utterly wicked his people, Israel, have become in their idolatry. The story begins with with threads that weave their way back to Joseph in Genesis. And here in Matthew 2, Joseph, Jesus' adopted father, uh, is just like the Joseph in the book of the in the book of Genesis, right? Both are godly men, d- divinely appointed dreams, and they're to lead. Both bring their families to Egypt, yet both come back again. And if you remember Joseph's story in Genesis, you know that it was through him that the small family of Israel came to live in Egypt. And after a few generations, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. And they they grew into a nation in captivity. The Egyptians became fearful of, of the Israelites. And Pharaoh commanded that the male children be killed. And so God sent Moses to demand freedom for his people, judging Egypt and her gods, and bringing his people out of the promised land to Israel. The prophet that, that Matthew's quoting here is Hosea. In Hosea chapter 11, when Egypt, I'm sorry, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son, and, they, and, more they were, and the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals 
and burning offerings to idols. This is exactly the context that Hosea is referring to. God calling His Son, Israel, out of Egypt on a journey to the Promised Land. So Jesus is reliving this exodus. He's standing in for an entire nation of Israel as the true Son of God. But the story's not exactly the same, is it? God's calling Jesus and His family to flee Israel to go to Egypt. It's the exact opposite of the Exodus story. God is giving Israel, under Herod, a blistering rebuke here. Israel has become like Egypt. Israel's king is the Pharaoh, the one demanding uh, male children to be murdered. Israel has become a home to false gods. And the true Israel incarnate, Jesus has to flee first to Egypt for protection from Israel before God can call His Son out of Egypt and back into the Promised Land. In using Hosea in this setting, God rebukes Israel even as He shows us that that Jesus has come to save people just like Israel by fulfilling Israel's covenant and pursuing the lost sheep of Israel. The next section in this text shows just how bleakly human sin has, uh, has developed and the reason Jesus descended to save us. Then Herod, when he saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And in all that region... Uh, who were two years old and under, and according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Lots of churches skip over this part of Matthew especially right after Christmas. <laughs> and I kind of understand why. I mean, who wants to really preach and hear about the slaughter of innocents when they're still trying to bask in the glory and the romance of Christmas? <laughs> but this passage reminds me of the reality of the world we live in. And how that, all of that Christmas peace, all that hope, love, Hope, joy that we celebrated a couple weeks ago. Now it's like some kind of cosmic commercial break from the evil and ugliness of this world. But that's the story about Herod's evil ways. Like so many similar stories being told in the news right now. This story is just another reality call as to why Jesus had to be born in the first place. To save us from an evil and sinful and dying world. We can pretend to be shocked and surprised or even pretend to be removed by centuries from the horror of Herod's massacre. But do you watch the news? Are we kidding ourselves? If we we deny or dismiss that these same horrors still exist even now in our day and age. So Herod becomes one more king in a long line of humanity's kings who have allied themselves with the world, allied themselves with Satan, allied themselves with the devil, allied themselves with what Revelation refers to as the dragon. And Herod fought against God and his image bearers slaughtering dozens of babies and toddlers in order to cling to his crown. And this shows that Herod Herod got it. Herod understood what Jesus' coming meant, at least in some warped way. He understood that the coming of Israel's true king meant that the, the end of the line for the dragon's puppet kings... 
And so he did what dragons always do. He sought to rule by blood and devouring. And yet God was using this horror to fulfill his unchanging word. The time, this time from the prophet of Jeremiah, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. There's a quotation from Jeremiah 31. And this is a surprising text to quote from Jeremiah 31. If the only thing you know about Jeremiah 31 is this verse. Because in reality, Jeremiah 31 is an exciting and uplifting chapter. The context of the chapter is rejoicing at Israel's return from captivity, from exile. And the prophet is describing the return of the Israelites as God's firstborn son, like a virgin that's returning to God's salvation. But Matthew quotes the bleakest part of this chapter. This is an allusion to the death of the patriarch Jacob's beloved Rachel near Bethlehem in Genesis 35, and in great sorrow. The context for Jeremiah calls us to imagine Rachel's sorrow at watching her children, Israel, go into exile, many of whom would die in captivity in Babylon. So what's the point of Matthew bringing Jeremiah 31 into this? Matthew knows his Jewish readers. He knows that if he just quotes a little bit of it, it'll bring the whole chapter to mind. And they'll think about how this note of sorrow sits in a celebration of salvation for the exile in, chapter, in Jeremiah 31. So Matthew's goal is to have them understand that Jesus' salvation is going to bring jubilation as well. But that jubilation is going to be at the cost of his own blood. It'll be the result of a battle fought with bloodshed and innocence thrown down. That Jesus is going to save. He's going to bring exile to an end through his own exile. As the innocents are slaughtered by King Herod, so Jesus himself will be slaughtered. But he will triumph in death. Finally, Matthew tugs on one more thread in Jesus' story, drawing us back to the tapestry of the Hebrew Bible. Look in verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warmed in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. There are a few things I need you to understand about this last episode that Matthew's describing. You may have already noticed this in your life. Maybe you haven't. There is no corresponding Old Testament prophecy that says Jesus will be a Nazarene. There's no verse in the Old Testament that says he will be called a Nazarene. So what's Matthew getting at? Why would Matthew say that something's there if something's not there? First, I want to say something that sounds obvious, but i got to say it out loud to make sure we're all on the same page. Matthew's not mistaken. It's not that he's unaware that that, that sentence doesn't exist in the Old Testament. I need you to understand that the exquisite, deep, rich Old Testament knowledge 
on display in Matthew's gospel tells us there's no way Matthew has messed up. No way. He's a master of the Hebrew Bible. All that in addition to the fact that it's Scripture. Remember? So what's going on? So Matthew's doing a few things here. First of all, in, uh, in phrases, he phrases verse 23 differently than he does verse 15 and verse 17. In verse 15 and 17, he says that this fulfills, what Je- that Jesus fulfills what the prophet had spoken of, followed by a quotation from that prophet. And here in verse 23, he just says that Jesus went to live in Nazareth. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. Nazareth. So that it was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he'd be called the Nazarene. Jesus is being presented here, not just as a fulfillment of multiple scattered prophecies, but in the speech, the prophets, in the word, in the words, the prophets. So he will fulfill what the prophets said. He's cluing us in on Matthew's. Um, on Matthew's purpose here, which is to draw multiple themes, multiple pictures from the prophets through the Nazarene language, through the Hebrew language. Weaving it together into something beautiful. And to see it, you have to know the Old Testament. You have to know some Hebrew wordplay around a few Hebrew terms. I don't know about you, I didn't like Hebrew when I I took it in school. And I'm sure all of you took Hebrew in school and excelled at it. So for those of you like me who did not uh, enjoy it very much, let's dive into what that looks like, all right? The, uh, The term Nazarene brings both the language of holy warriors and a righteous branch of David together. In number six and number 16, there's a group called the Nazarites. And they are set apart. They are holy warriors. Think Samson, uh, but without the women problems. (laughs) So Jesus' relationship to this term shows that he is set apart. He is a holy warrior. But also Jesus' hometown. Nazareth is almost identical to the Hebrew word for branch. Which immediately calls to mind the prophecy of Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and and the fear of the Lord. Both of these Nazarene-related ideas, a holy one set apart and a branch, both those things intersect in Isaiah chapter 4. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem, will be called holy. This passage describes the restoration of God's people after the exile. So what's Matthew giving to us here? Well, he's saying that the prophets collectively anticipate the Messiah as a holy warrior, as a living branch from the dead stump of Jesse, from David's line, of rebellious and exiled Israel. We've already established in chapter 1 that Jesus is indeed from the line of David. And the line of Jesse. And the most shocking of all is these two massively glorious things that would come together in a Messiah that is raised in backwater Nazareth. Nazareth is a tiny, insignificant town of mostly laborers and builders like Joseph, like Jesus, and most likely all the people he knew growing up. 
our God came in glorious humility. He's he's a living branch of a royal line, but one growing up in, in humble circumstances. He is from a dead and inglorious stump of a once great tree, but this branch is going to grow taller than David. Taller than David ever did. He will be a world swallowing tree. And we, we are in fact branches from that same line through Christ. We are all shoots of this new growth. My grandmother has been a seamstress her entire life. She's 91 years old. She worked for Hanes. She sewed t-shirts. And she hemmed people's clothes in our community. She was also an avid quilter. Before she got to where her fingers couldn't do it anymore, she had uh, she'd won awards uh, with her quilts. She made a double wedding ring pattern quilt for me and Jenny when we got married. She put together, in her probably the last quilt she ever made, uh, was a crib quilt for Thomas when he was born. When my grandmother had to move from the house that she'd been in forever, in my opinion, forever, uh, to live closer to my family. They found all these boxes, Tupperware containers of scraps for quilt making. And in one of those boxes, they pulled out what looked to me like a bunch of nothing. Just a bunch of scraps that I have no clue what it was. And we asked my grandma, and she said she remembers in 1940, when they would use flour sacks, her and her aunt would take and make this yo-yo pattern. And my parents, my grandma, tried to describe to me what this quilt is supposed to look like when all I can see is this right here. And it made no sense to me. How is this a quilt? There's a bunch of holes in it. So my mom did something for my grandma. She found someone else who does quilts and had it all put together to make the quilt itself. Every one of those tiny ones are the ones my grandma made when she was 10 years old or so in 1940. Out of flower sacks. Once it's all together, it's beautiful. And you're looking at it piece by piece. It's a little bit ridiculous. I keep using the image of tapestry and threads to illustrate the relationship between the first and the second testament, between the old and the new. Matthew is weaving his gospel onto the unfinished edge of the Old Testament. And just like the pieces that I couldn't quite see in my head from my grandma's quilt, you might ask If the Bible is two testaments but one tapestry, what picture should I see? What picture is woven onto it? What would I see if I backed up and looked at the whole thing? One way you would answer that is that the tapestry depicts a scene from Revelation. A holy warrior stomping on the head of a serpentine dragon with a baby in its mouth. The dragon fell from glory. The dragon that desired to be as God himself lifted up in pride and this dragon incited our first human parents to sin in the same way. He said, you disobey God and you will be like a God. And we fell for it. And we decided that we were gods. And we did whatever was in our hearts, whatever our evil desires were, and we found that we were wicked. We allied with the dragon and we made, we we became like him. But God promised he would crush the dragon's head. That he would send a seed 
born of a woman to crush the head of this dragon, even at great cost to himself. And so the story unfolds to the flood with God's image being de- increasingly defaced and degraded and, and thoughts and intentions in their heart were only evil. So God sent death in judgment and wiped out his defaced image. Yet remembering the promise, he preserved the line of the woman's seed, rescuing righteous Noah and his family from the flood. And so the line continues to Abraham. And God calls Abraham out of dragon-worshipping religion in Ur. And he doubles down on his promise. Now we know that his seed will come not just from the woman, but from Abraham's line. But Abraham's line is enslaved in Egypt. And the dragon rears his head again. He shows his particular loathing for babies. Pharaoh, terrified by this God, blessed and vigorous people, demanded the murder of the Hebrew babies, and yet God preserves his people. He judges the dragon and his worshipers, and he sends his people off towards the promised land. But the promised land is occupied. It's enemy territory. And many of the nations that sprang from Noah in Genesis 10 have gone into Canaan and are now worshiping demon gods there. It's populated with false gods and immoral practices. So God gave the Canaanites many years to repent of their backsliding as Israel languished in slavery, but they didn't repent. So God sends his people, holy warriors, to slay the dragon, burn the green groves, tear down the Asherah poles, and they don't finish the work. Rather, they become baby devourers themselves, and they worship the dragon. They broke the covenant. They broke their faith. Even some kings practiced sacrificial demonic worship. So God sent them to be enslaved by many nations. The most recent to this story is Rome. These are the pieces that Matthew is weaving together so skillfully. And that's why all of this tapestry shows us a God who calls us to Him, who wants our love, who wants us to follow Him, who wants us to reject the world and the sin that is in it. God's woven this masterpiece of history. He's taken all the pieces of Israel's past, and through Jesus, He made things right again. That's what this image says. On the left, it's a bunch of pieces that aren't really together. And when it gets to the king, all of a sudden everything's in order. Jesus is calling you today to live a life not of this world, but of him. A life of submission, not to our evil desires, but to the God Almighty. This story, this tapestry that's been woven has always had one thing in common, and that's the glory of God. He's calling us to that glory, to spend eternity in His greatness. The history that Matthew has pulled together with the inspiration that God has shown us, it's shown us more that this quote from C.S. Lewis holds true. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. I want you to see Matthew for what it is, a beautiful tapestry that shows God's glory in all its splendor. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much specifically for the book of Matthew and the ability he has to show us things that we may may have overlooked, we may have missed. The closer we are to things and the closer we, we look, 
the harder it is for us to see, Lord, give us perspective. And give us love for you. Thank you for your glory. And thank you for your son. It's in his name. Amen.